Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the final session of February Flare Up, Climate Change and Climate Adaptation Edition. So far this month, we have learned the fundamentals of climate and climate change, taken a look to the past and explored historical data and historical climate trends. We've also learned about various climate data applications and tools that are freely available. This week, we will look forward. We will hear about how climate data is used in day-to-day -day fire operations from a forecaster with the BC Wildfire Service. And we will also learn about the national significant wildland fire potential outlook from one of its key contributors with the US Bureau of Land Management. Today's session will be moderated by Mike Flanagan, Professor and Research Chair for Predictive Services, Emergency Management and Fire Science at Thompson Rivers University. Mike is also the Science Director at Candle Wildfire. With that, I will hand the session over to Mike. Good morning, good day, everyone. It's great to be with you. This is the fourth in our series, as Karen mentioned, and it's, we have two great talks today. I look forward more, more like a look in the mirror or uh, kind of taking stock of where we are in terms of using climate in day-to-day -day fire operations. I'm coming to you today from Kamloops, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Tlumps people. So um, we're going to have two presenters, as I mentioned, Jesse Ellis with the BC Wildfire Service and Nick Nasler, and he's at the National Interagency Fire and Coordination Center in Boise, Idaho. So approximately each speaker is going to talk about 30 minutes, then we'll have time for Q&A, and um, we'll use the chat for the Q&A. And if there's any technical issues that come up during the presentation, put in the chat, and the session will be recorded, and I think the recording's already started. Um, and, you know, before we get going, I used to have a supervisor, and he said, if you learn one new thing in a day, it's been a good day. Well, this has been a good series because I've learned quite a few things and I look forward to learning a few more things in the next hour and a half or so. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Jesse Ellis. He's a fire weather forecaster for the BC Wildfire Service. He's in the Southeast region in Castlegar, and he's going to be talking to us about how he uses climate information in his job. And so over to you, Jesse, and here we go. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Mike. Uh, just quick check, you got my screen okay? Yep, we're all good. Wonderful. Okay, week four. Uh, first, thank you for the invite, and I'm grateful to be here on the unceded territory of the Silks, Sinaiks, and the Tanaha here in Castlegar, British Columbia. Um, a little bit about myself. I've got a little bit of experience on an in initial attack crew, and I've got about 13 years of uh, operational forecasting experience in BC. Um, I like to garden. I'm really excited about squash this year. So I think this year is gonna be the year of squash. Uh, I'm, I'm done with tomatoes, so uh, I wish me luck on that. And uh, if you have any tips on squash growing, please let me know. I'm not looking at giant pumpkins. I'm more looking at like sort of the kabocha varieties. Um, why this picture? So I'm a meteorologist and I'm here talking about climate. So why are we looking at this picture? Well, uh, when I come to work in the morning, the two top priorities for me are field staff safety and uh, conducting our business in an effective, cost-efficient uh, way. So field staff safety is important to me. And so that's why I try to keep in mind pictures and scenes like this while I'm sitting back looking at uh, computer weather models. Um, so I'm gonna, I, my section is in two parts. Uh, first, I'm gonna introduce the BC Fire Weather Forecaster team. And then I want to look at the climate data in day-to-day -day operational use. So we're gonna look at a few things, the 500 millibar surface, the buildup index, the hot dry windy index, and a special case study on a decision either to or not to suppress uh, a fire on a multiple lightning start event on the BC coast. So first off, fire weather forecasters. 
Uh, there is currently a team of four of us. We uh, are looking to build this team out. Our, our provincial lead, Matt McDonald, over, also looks after Coastal. We've got Paul Emmett, uh, myself, and Brett Soderholm looking at after three other regions in BC. We also have a team of veteran contract meteorologists less, led by Christina Van Eaton, who uh, fill, do the backup and also fill in these uh, fire centers that don't have any staff forecasters yet. Uh, I'm going to quickly rip through our primary forecast due or a few of our primary forecast duties. So that being uh, our live weather briefings, our text forecasts, and the, the text warnings that we issue. But that, as you can see, that's among a bunch of other stuff that we look at throughout the year. So um, the first part of, of my day or the first deliverable that I have is the weather briefing. And my role is kind of like a storyteller. So my, my goal is to try to narrow in on the story of the day. And in order to do that, we're quite flexible in the kinds of uh, information that we, that we bring forward, the kinds of graphics. So we'll look at things that, like lightning and how much rain fell over the last 24 hours or maybe the last week, depending on the holdover potential. We'll look at fuel moisture codes. And you can't have a weather briefing without looking at the satellite picture in the 500 millibar chart here. Um, and my, the goal on this section isn't to explain each one of these components of a BC wildfire briefing. It's just to show the variety of things that we're going to be looking at. So uh, the, the briefings are usually centered around the 500 millibar chart, and we'll talk more about that soon. But we're also going to be looking at smoke, depending on, on what's going on out there, the hot, dry, windy index, and some weird stuff that happens during the overnight period. Overnight recoveries can be different at different elevations. So that is how warm and how dry did it stay during the overnight period. Uh, it's not just deterministic guidance that we look at. We also look at uh, pro probabilistic ensemble guidance as well. Uh, some folks might recognize some of these graphics. If you don't, that's okay. So Ensemble guidance just means you look at a number of different computer weather models rather than just one to get your answer and you start talking about probabilities and likelihood, et cetera. Uh, not only focused on wildfire though, uh, since BC wildfire is, uh, is transitioning or ha it has been a part of uh, year, -round, um, year round support for other government agencies in the, in the province of BC, and that trend is continuing here. We'll, we'll also look at the flooding situation to see what kind of resource draws might be coming our way. And we'll also look at our neighbors to the, the north and the, and the east and, and sometimes to the south when it comes to likelihood of the requirements for deployments or imports. Uh, some sample products. We crank one of these text forecasts out every day for each of the six regions plus uh, one provincial overlook. We will also be issuing spot forecasts throughout this, the season. Uh, and, and this is, a, this is a, a product catered to one site in particular or one part of a larger fire. We also issue weather warnings. If we see things come up that might impact staff safety that maybe weren't covered on the briefing or maybe were covered on the briefing, but we want to make sure that everybody out in the field has that information and then a, a number of other text and table products that go out the door. Who's our audience? So all, basically all four pillars of, of uh, wildfire management, prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery. So that's all I had for uh, looking at who we are and what we do. I've got four examples of uh, how we use climate data operationally. So the first one, we're gonna look at the 500 millibar anomaly. First off, I just want to quickly introduce what is the 500 millibar surface, also known as the 500 hectopascal surface, but uh, 500 millibar is more fun to say. So this is a surface in the atmosphere. It's a constant pressure surface between about 5,000 6, and 6,000 meters above sea level. And it's kind of that sweet spot between not getting, not getting impacted, not getting affected by uh, surface friction and uh, other surface driven processes, but it's not so high up there that there that the relationship between the features on the weather map and the surface weather 
uh, is uh, sort of falls apart. So if you go too high up, those features that you see way up there, say um, at uh, two or 300 millibars up near the tropopause, they, they don't really have a great uh, connection to what's going on in terms of the sensible weather on the ground. So uh, pressure goes down with increasing elevation. So we're basically picking one pressure surface to look at to see what kind of weather maps we can build from that. So this first slide on the 500 millibar uh, sort of mini, mini tutorial, we could talk about this all day, is looking at the 500 milli, where the 500 millibar height is over a point. Okay, next, I wanna look at where the 500 millibar surface is if we connect, if we, if we look at it along a line. And we can see that uh, warmer air results in a thicker layer and cooler air results in a thinner layer. So now we went from a point, now we have a, 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 a slope here, a gradient between areas where there is average of warmer temperatures below the 500 millibar surface and, and cooler temperatures below the 500 millibar surface. The next, the next stage is we, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. My pen is on. The next stage, oh no, is that we can look at a, a 2D surface. And now we can project that surface onto a map, onto a chart, and then we can start reading it like a topographic map, finding upper highs, upper lows, upper ridges, and upper troughs. And these features do a really good job of characterizing the air mass, uh, things like stability, temperature, sometimes uh, moisture content, although that's a little bit tougher to pin down just from the 500 millibar chart. We can also identify the speed and direction of the upper wind. So the 500 millibar chart, these are the reasons why it, it, it is part of the, the foundation of a fire weather briefing, just because it's, it, uh, it's able to help tell that story in a really effective way. Uh, the models also, the computer weather models also do a pretty good job of, of uh, handling it. Now, where does climate come in? Well, the 500 millibar anomaly is something that we pay attention to. And the anomaly just means the current height compared to the climatological normal. And we have a, a picture here um, from a Canada Wildfire website, the, the heat wave uh, uh, paper here. And the areas in red are areas where the 500 millibar bar anomaly is uh, increasingly strong in the positive direction. So this is a positive anomaly over BC. This means the 500 millibar heights were much higher than the climatological normal. So that's the link to, to climatology. Uh, so the next question is, why do we care? These, these 500 millibar anomalies are really important because they tell us, uh, or they are associated with extended periods of hot and dry weather, which is, uh, which is the way that we most effectively dry out our fuels. So under a strong positive 500 millibar anomaly feature, we can expect to see drying of the of uh, fuels. Next, and by the way, this is the uh, evolution of the 2021 heat wave here. Um, the, the way in which a strong positive 500 millibar anomaly uh, culminates or or finishes or is displaced eastward since we're in the mid latitude westerlies here is really significant. So it, it, it's possible for a strong 500 millibar anomaly to go away quietly and, uh, and uh, slowly, but usually what we see is an upper ridge breakdown, a, a, a term coined by Nick Nimchuk a while ago from Alberta, fire weather forecaster. And, and that's where we see a, a, a sometimes a, a very aggressive shift between stable conditions and unstable conditions. We see deep vertical mixing. We see strong gusty winds. We see uh, lightning outbreaks. So we're, so think in the fire context, think about uh, significant start days, think about significant spread days, and those the spread direction during the breakdown of a strong upper ridge can also uh, catch folks off guard if it, we often see a change in the spread direction at the end of uh, when the 500, the strong positive 500 millibar anomaly comes to an end. 
So that was the first example of how we use climate data in day-to-day -day operations. Next up is looking at the buildup index. So there's gonna be varying degrees of, of uh, uh, knowledge on, on uh, the buildup index. Some people on the call here may, may have basically invented the buildup index. Um, so in, in short, it's a numeric rating. It's a number representing the total amount of fuel available for combustion. If you've seen this chart before on the, the uh, NRCAN site, you'll find the buildup index in this part here. Uh, it's, it's a blend of the DMC and the DC, the, the Duff Moisture Code and the Drought Code. Uh, and it, uh, if, if you think of the context of building a fire in a fireplace, the buildup index is kind of like the amount of logs you put in there. So it's the amount of fuel of, available to burn. Uh, I've got a buildup index map here on the left-hand side showing the BUI in BC on August 3rd, 2022. So have a look at that map and have a think on, or, or consider which areas are the most significant buildup index uh, areas for BC. Okay, you probably looked at the, found the same spots that I did. Uh, the areas with the orange and, and uh, bullseyes of red. So that's BUI of above 160. The, the, the numbers don't really matter. But when we compare that to climatology, we can see a somewhat different picture. So the area in the south central part of BC that was really lit right up with red, is the, the, the anomaly is not significant or not nearly as significant as other parts of BC. So we've got a, a pocket up or one station up north. We've got a couple stations here in the Robson Valley uh, over on the, the east, east central part of BC. And then the most significant BUI anomaly is actually over towards the BC Alberta border. So I, I'm, I'm not gonna say that I discount the actual BUI on a given day, but I, I definitely pay as much, if not more attention to where things are unusual. Because I feel like when I'm, when I'm in the role of the storyteller, I want to make sure that people in the different parts of the region uh, really understand where they might be caught off guard. So when we're looking at significant BUI anomalies, um, this is something that might result in unusual fire behavior. It might result in fuels at different elevations waking up um, when uh, at sort of an unexpected uh, part of the season. Different fuel types may behave in unusual ways. And also, especially in the mountains, different aspects uh, might be starting to see more aggressive fire growth. So perhaps uh, those, those cooler, shadier north aspects start to come into play uh, as we see these, uh, these elevated values. And, and uh, the anomalies I feel are important to help uh, per, or help reduce the chance that uh, our folks out in the field are going to get caught off guard. Now, not all anomalies are the same. I like to look at anomalies that coincide with significant numbers. So in this case, if we look up at the sort of in the BC Alberta elbow here, yes, we've got a, a positive anomaly, but those values might not be all that high. So even though it's higher than normal, it still might be relatively low. Looking down towards the, the uh, uh, southeastern part of BC here, we have an anomaly that coincides with significant values. So this is where I would be uh, drawing people's attention uh, for that BUI anomaly. Okay, uh, next up is the hot, dry, windy index. Now this is, this is uh, the hot, dry, windy index. I love the name, uh, HDW. And it's uh, derived from wind speed and something called the vapor pressure deficit. So, and the vapor pressure deficit is, is in very basic terms, just heat and dryness. And the, a, a larger VPD has, uh, is associated with larger evaporation rates and, and also associated with plant health. And uh, it's been identified as something that can help um, show these or, or give a heads up to large or significant spread event days or dangerous fire behavior. So in some cases, it's, it has outperformed some of the usual or some of the traditional fire weather indices that people have come to use over, over a number of decades. Um, 
this is something that that uh, I that we have been introducing to our audience in in BC here and there. And where is the climate tie-in? So the climate tie-in is that when we're looking at a new uh, a new variable like the the hot, dry, windy index, it can be difficult to to express or it can be difficult to remember which values are significant. So it's a brand new indice, a brand new index. And so somebody might say, well, is is 200 significant or is 20 significant? Is this uh, and and so on the left hand side. Uh, we can see that we've got sort of this map um, display of the hot, dry, windy index and the second shading. So the first sort of instance of coming into that light orange is where we have above average HDW for that location for that time of year. So I, I really love uh, the combination of the, the map display here to help point out what is significant. And we also have a timeline and the timeline is is just wonderful. So it, the the percentiles are stacked vertically here, and so everything above this first line of uh, that light orange, this is all above average for that time of year for that location. And I, I love the timeline for for that reason, but also it's it's a great way to be able to to throw back to previous days. So as a forecaster telling my story in the morning, I can say. Remember what we saw yesterday? Well, today is going to be similar, more aggressive or, or uh, less uh, than what we saw yesterday. And, and here's a, the sort of the ensemble guidance on, on where we could be headed. So a pretty quick example there. Uh, my last example here, here's a, a case study of the operational use of, of climate data looking at ISI climatology. First off, I'm going to paint the picture of what happened. We had a multiple lightning start event off the north coast of, uh, or the, the north end of Vancouver Island. This is part of the mid coast zone in uh, coastal British Columbia. It had been previously hot and dry, uh, so that the, the fuels were quite receptive to new starts. In the picture here, you see that we've got uh, extensive cloud cover. This was sort of a one day blip of of uh, one or two day event of a little bit of cloudy weather and, and a few showers coming in. But the, the general pattern was for hot and dry conditions uh, and which are, you know, the, it, it happens on the coast, but uh, the coast is more known for sort of more temperate, more moderate uh, temperatures and RHs. So it was, it, was a, it was a significant start event for this part of the world. Um, very remote. Um, the, the access was quite poor, that we've got a combination of lakes and inlets in this part of the world. Road access is tough. Uh, barging would have been an option to get folks in there. You can see that, uh, well, the, the terrain looks sort of rolling. There is some very steep terrain and rocky bluffs in here as well. Uh, so pretty difficult terrain to travel around in. Um, and uh, the timber values, so very high value timber in this part of the world, and you can see that we're not ridged out anywhere. If we had a fire get up and go, uh, it, it is the door is open to the north, the south, the east, and the west, just depending on uh, uh, the drivers of fire behavior and spread. So the, the decision was, uh, oh, I'll say one more thing. Some folks uh, look at coastal uh, ecosystems and they say, well, it hardly ever burns. The tough part about this one as well, this was in 2019, and it had only been three or four years, it was only four years before that the, we had a significant coastal fire event uh, that ran 18 kilometers through big coastal timber in a 12-hour a period. So it, it wasn't... Uh, the, the potential was certainly there for significant fire growth on these ones. Um, but due to the access and due to um, a, a few other factors, a decision had to be, the question was asked, do we do anything with these fires? And um, so we, we looked at uh, a few things, you know, the, the, the cost benefit, the, the question is, is it gonna cost more money to go put these things out 
than the value of the timber that it's going to burn through and other not only timber value but other values as well there's also the question of crew safety uh, do we put folks at risk that's folks on the ground as well as aviation um, staff and so the the decision was also made harder because the fires on this day were still quite small the each successive day um, and 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 a little bit more growth was going to make the fires exponentially more expensive to go put out. So a decision had to be made on on what we we're going to what they were going to do. Um, this is out. This was out of the range of a deterministic weather forecast model. So w trying to put trying to uh, predict the the temperature RH wind speed wind direction and precip for a two month period. Remember, this was early July. Uh, would have been almost impossible and very unreliable in terms of the the, uh, the the growth projections off of just deterministic forecast model guidance. Uh, this was also out of the realm of a seasonal forecast. Uh, you know, if we if we looked at the one month forecast and it said that our temperatures were going to be on average a degree warmer than normal and the precip was going to be 10% lower than normal, that doesn't really help the decision maker determine whether or not to go put these things out. So myself and the, and the uh, fire behavior analyst on shift looked at the ISI and, and it, was, it was determined as the, the best way to try, to try to identify how many significant growth days were gonna remain in the season before the fall rains of, uh, arrived roughly two months later if, if, if we look at the, uh, the usual weather patterns in the fall on the coast. Um, so what is the I, what what is the ISI? It is a number that is associated with the uh, the how quickly fuel will will burn. So I used the analogy before that uh, if the BUI is kind of like the logs in a fireplace, the ISI is kind of like how much air you let in or or blowing fresh oxygen onto the fire. So it it uh, helps determine how quickly things are going to burn different ISI or ISI means different things in different fuel types. When we looked at the ISI, we looked at a number of different values, benchmark values to try to identify uh, how many significant growth days there were going to be in the rest of the fire season. For the purpose of this presentation, I use the data for uh, an ISI greater than or equal to 11. And this is what we found anywhere between zero and 12 uh, significant spread event days from the most representative weather stations near uh, these uh, lightning starts. The next step we, we took was, well, this is for the entire year. So we can narrow this down to the number of ISI days greater than 11 after July 1st. And that told a different story. So most years might be closer to the zero. And then we had a we had maybe a two fifths of the years between two and five. Um, looking at, at at a twenty year data set, I know that's not a long data set, but that's what we had for the nearest weather stations here. Uh, the orange box and whisker plot on the left shows uh, the full season. The one on the right shows just after July first. The results were that the the interquartile range had uh, between zero and three. Uh, significant spread event days, looking at the climatology, the max was five and the average was 1.2. And the decision makers had set up a, a threshold of around two or three significant spread event days to tip that balance, the cost benefit on whether they should go put this out, these fires out or not. Uh, so the, the FBAN and I presented uh, the data, not in this format, but uh, the, the message was you're probably going to get uh, either zero or one significant spread event day for the rest of the year. And uh, worst case scenario, you might get two or three, and it's quite it's unlikely that you're going to get five. We took a few other factors in, into consideration. We were able to, to jump onto the tail end of of the weather forecast that we had available to us to look at the setup to see if it was conducive to multiple spread event days in the short term, which it wasn't. So a number of things came into this and uh, you know, we can see here that uh, 
2019 at the most representative weather station here, we had one day uh, above an ISI of 11. So that was a, the forecast verified quite nicely. And um, the decision was made, uh, be, the, dec the decision ended up being that they didn't act on these ones. They went out and checked on them uh, periodically to make sure that they didn't uh, grow beyond certain uh, identified trigger points. But uh, no, they, they, we, we didn't put resources out on the, in the field. We, we didn't hammer them with, uh, with air resources either. So um, we saved taxpayer money, avoided risk to staff by using climatology to make a difficult decision. But at the end, it was generally uh, agreed that it was uh, the, the right call. Now, <laughs> however, nothing is static, right? And so when, I'm, when I was watching the, uh, some of the presentations from earlier this, this uh, February flare-up uh, month, I am really interested to see some of these tools because past climate data is great. And that's, that's all we had to, to work with for this decision. But I see us in the future using a combination of past climate data plus uh, some of the tools that are currently in development around, uh, uh, around some of these fire weather indices and their climatology to, uh, to be able to provide the decision makers with the best possible information. And um, yeah, it's, it's possible in, that in the future with these tools, uh, it could tip these significant de uh, decisions in another direction uh, than if we were only looking at past climate data. So we did a review. Uh, we looked at the fire weather forecaster team in BC. Uh, we looked at a few ways that, uh, that I use uh, climatology in the operational work as a fire weather forecaster. And uh, I hope everybody has a great 2023 fire season. And, and again, if you have any tips on growing squash, I would love to hear. Thanks, Jesse, for that uh, walkthrough of how climate's used in a fire meteorologist position in British Columbia. And um, we now open the floor up to some questions. If you could put those in the chat. That would be great. Um, I'll start with a question while people think and uh, start to type. Um, so you mentioned ensembles and you mentioned multi-model ensembles, but do you use ensembles from an individual model? Like there's various pro products, the North America ensemble, you know, like the, so are those used as well? And probabilistic yeah. how do you use ensembles yeah it's yeah yeah um well one example of a model that's uh that's the, an ensemble based on one computer weather model would be the spaghetti chart right yeah so so this one here we it uses the canadian model the, can, you still got my screen okay right yeah yeah it uses the canadian model and it applies a number of different perturbations to that one model to see how quickly it diverges. And that, that translates or that helps us identify the confidence that we should have in, in any one of those individual solutions. The bold line, the bold black line is the one that we get on our weather maps or on our, or on our weather apps in our pockets, right? But how, how much spread there is in here helps uh, me determine whether I should tell people, yes, you can believe, what I'm telling you, or this is one option, one one model, one uh, possible solution, but my confidence is really low. Uh, other the the multi-model type stuff is are are things like we're looking at a, a number of different 500 millibar forecasts, as we've got in the top center here, or looking at a number of different uh, uh, preset uh, forecasts uh, from from a few different computer weather models. Does that help, Mike? Yep, that helps a lot. So we do have some questions in the in the chat, and okay. some of them are one of them's challenging, and the one, other one's interesting. Right. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see them or not, but uh, 1980 was the start of a warming period, and after a period of cooling, okay. And HDW is based on climatology, 
and should you kind of include this variation that you see in the climatology and I realize you're you're not the uh, creator of the HDW but you do yeah. use it so and if so you know how different would these graphs look yeah okay that's a that's a great question and but the person asking the question I think knows more about climate than I do and uh, so when I look at the HDW chart here um, one one first off this is the Jeffs which is a, a quite a, a, a the, the grid spacing is is not overly tight and so when I'm when I'm looking at this I'm the story that I'm telling on a day like to, a day like this this was August 14th is um, after a period of near, near normal hot dry windy conditions we saw a spike yesterday and everybody on the call will know what that spike was because it would have been associated with an, a, a, a dry cold front or something if we're punching up to the 95th percentile. Um, what I would be saying next is, however, don't, even though our, our HDW is dropping off significantly today, our fuels have a time lag. And so they will be remembering the dryness that that they experienced yesterday and so even though we're falling down off of this spike don't let your guard down because we have seen anecdotally that the the second day after a hot dry windy spike is can be as significant if not more significant than the first day of a hot dry windy spike so hopefully you get the idea that i'm that i'm i'm talking about i'm talking about trends I'm talking about things in relation to what we saw yesterday. So if this whole timeline was shifted a little bit higher or a little bit lower, if the climatology was different, it wouldn't change my story. So I'm I'm not I'm not too worried about that. Um, but uh, and I'll stop talking now. Okay, thank you. So the next question is. Um, used ISI 11, an example you gave. And so the question is, why 11? <laughs> like, why yeah. not nine? Why not 15? <laughs> love it. Love it. Uh, the, the, the F band, Chris Bronken, is way smarter than I am on uh, around fire behavior in, the C, in what we use C5 to represent. And 11 uh, might not have been the number that was that, that was sort of our final number, but it was one of the numbers that we would have looked at 9, 11, 13, 15. We would have built that that likelihood out for each one of a number of different uh, values. And so for the presentation today, I just used 11. You used the term C5. Could you just tell people what C5 is? Yeah, C5 yeah, fits you. better out east than in BC, but I know you use it. So Thank, thank you, Mike. Uh, C5 is one of the benchmark fuel types used in the Canadian Forest Fire Danger Rating System. Coastal BC is made up of uh, Sitka spruce, uh, uh, um, uh, cedar, hemlock, um, and, and big timber, big trunks, high crown base height. So there's a lot of space between the ground and the first branches on the trees. And C5 is a fuel type uh, red and white pine from out east that is not meant for coastal BC, but is it is uh, closer uh, representation than other fuel types uh, in in the the system that we use. Is that close enough, Mike? Did I not make too many errors on that answer? <laughs> That's great. Okay. So, so a couple more uh, question, and uh, I see Nick's posted a, a link for the hot dry windy in the chat. So 2021 flooding, okay? Um, a lot of things for disaster risk reduction really don't take climate change into account, okay? And so there was lots of damage from 2021 floodings if you use 30 year averages. So because the climate is changing, would the ISI be subject to the same limitations as deciding to fight a fire or not fight a fire? Can you answer the, or can you ask that question with different words? <laughs> sure. Um, using an ISI threshold, will that change because the climate's changing? Maybe Shang Li wants to answer this one. Shang Li Wang I'll, has just published a I'll paper. 
I'll, I'll take a wild guess. And my wild guess is that fire behavior and how far a fire will grow will still depend, the, the same physics should still apply. I think the implication, I, my opinion, not being a climatologist, is that, the, is that the, where the climatology comes in is that the likelihood of exceedance of those values may change over time. But the, the on the ground fuels, weather and topography um, may not be impacted by changing climate. How does that land? That's great. Um, so yeah, yeah, there's a recent paper, I'll put it in the chat about critical fire weather. And, you know, whether you use ISI or FFMC or FWI, these are all components of the Canadian FWI system. They do change regionally and seasonally. Okay. But you're right. It's talking about a physical relationship. In the future, we may see a lot more days of ISI above 11 or whatever threshold you want to use. But the actual fire behavior physics are basically unchanged. We're just going to see more occurrence, as you mentioned. So, any further questions? I'll, I'll just have one before we take it over to, to Nick. And uh, so, you know, 500 millibar, you know, I'm a forecaster by training. Okay. And if I only had one map, that's the map I'd use to do my forecast. But can you share why, as a fire weather forecaster, why, what's the difference between a zonal flow, which means, you know, the, the contour lines are east west parallel versus a high amplitude, i.e., ridges and troughs? What's the big difference? Why, 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 why is this important? Whoa, I love it. It's, it's critically important. Um, from what I see in my day-to-day -day work, these high amplitude uh, waveforms in the 500 millibar flow uh, get stuck. And with, with, uh, they, with relation to the surface of the earth, the waves are moving, but, but they're moving within a, a, a moving fluid, which is the atmosphere. But within the, within, from, from the, uh, with respect to the ground, when the wave, stalls over one spot, one location, then we see the same weather continuing for days, if not weeks on end, when we have high amplitude, uh, strong waves in the, in, in the 500 millibar flow. Contrast that to a zonal flow or a westerly flow. Uh, the, the waves that come through, you don't see the, the same weather for more than two or three days at a time. And so, in the in a high amplitude flow with the the strong upper ridges and the deep upper troughs, the the strong ridges are can be called omega blocks. You might have heard that term before, and uh, are also associated with the 2021 heat wave. This is when we dry our our fuels out for a really 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 long time, but we know that the the ridge isn't going to stay there forever, and when it gets kicked when it gets displaced it usually gets displaced with wind and instability and so um, the high amplitude the high amplitude 500 millibar flow patterns in my mind are usually more more have greater impact than the uh the the short short waves in a zonal flow short waves in a zonal flow bring on average greater winds right um, but if, if it's not as hot and as dry, then those winds perhaps don't have as much impact than if they were to follow a strong upper ridge. Thank you, Jesse. Um, great presentation. And uh, stay around because after next presentation, if people say, oh, I meant to ask Jesse something, then you can come along. So shifting gears, and now we're going to be hearing from Nick Nasler. And he's a he's a fire weather forecaster and predictive services meteorologist. Is that the correct term at the National Interagency Fire and Coordination Center? He's going to be talking to us about the national significant wildland fire potential outlook and for the United States. 
And Nick, if you can tell us a few things about yourself, what kind of squash you like to grow or what have you, uh, that would be great. And uh, I turn it over to you. Yeah, I appreciate it, Mike and Jesse. Great presentation. It's always good to see what our friends north of the border, how they how they do what we do uh, down here. So I'll probably be touch, touching base with you offline. Uh, thanks again, Mike. Uh, I am a predictive services meteorologist uh, here in Boise, Idaho at the National Interagency Fire and Coordination Center. I work for the Bureau of Land Management, and I'll go into what predictive services is and what we do uh, here in a moment. A few things about myself. I love sports. I love the outdoors. Um, and Jesse, I had massive zucchinis last year and way too many of them that we ended up having to just throw some out because I could not shred and freeze any more or make any more zucchini fritters or bread uh, last summer and fall. So if you need some help with growing uh, zucchinis, just let me know because I don't think I'll be growing them this year. There's too many from last year. Um, 13 years uh, in fire, mostly as a meteorologist, uh, but also as an initial attack dispatcher and as a wildland firefighter. Uh, but like you said, my primary uh, experience within wildland fire has been as a meteorologist. Let me get my presentation up here. Give me one second. And get this show. Can everyone uh, see it? Good to go. Awesome. I will stop sharing my video because I'll be looking at the wrong screen. Uh, but this is subseasonal to seasonal forecasting for wildland fire. It should, probably should be more like wildland fire potential. Uh, my colleague, Rich Naden, who is in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and works for the Southwest Predictive Services Unit, uh, is our in-house SME. He will probably forget more about subseasonal to seasonal forecasting than I will learn, uh, and he was a massive uh, help of putting together this uh, presentation. Go forward here. Give me a sec. There we go. So predictive services, we were established in 2001. We have three functional areas, Intel, meteorology, fuels, and fire danger. Intel is essentially resource tracking. Uh, what are, where the resources are, what are they doing? Costs, acres, burned, number of fires, those sorts of things. Uh, meteorology, obviously we do the fire weather forecasting part of it and fuels and fire danger is what are the fuels, how much are the fuels are there? How dry they are? How is it going to interact to create a full fire environment forecast? Each one of the uh, different colored regions on that map there is a geographic area. And each one of those has its own predictive services unit. And we all issue forecasts independently, but collaboration and coordination obviously occurs and is very integral to the success of our program. And myself and Jim Wallman, who's my counterpart, we uh, and Steve Larrabee, we integrate these geographic area level outlooks into national level outlooks, which you'll see a couple examples here in a little bit. And our main goal is providing decision support for fire management in the national coordination system. So what do we do for decision support? We provide briefings, we provide products, and our goal is actionable intel. And we're a bit more strategic, more large scale, more long term. Uh, we try to, you know, where are the fires right now? How active are they? Where are the resources uh, helping to manage and or suppress these wildfires? What uh, is the weather and climate that is driving them or going to be driving them uh, in the next day, week, month, perhaps season? And then the underlying fuels and fire danger that help drive the fire occurrence and that fire activity. Other things we do is help uh, with planning and with training, research and development, and then committees and task teams which set, which set standards and curriculum for said training. But like I said, our main goal and mission is providing actionable intel to the decision makers at the national level and regional level, and even sometimes down to the field level. So the National Significant Wildland Fire Potential Outlook. This is one of our flagship products from Predictive Services. It's 
updated every month, usually on the first of every month, unless it happens to land on a holiday. But it forecasts above or below normal significant fire potential for the next four months. What does normal mean? Well, how often do you get significant fires? And what do significant fires mean? <laughs> it means a large fire that requires the mobilization of resources outside the immediate area. And we have analyses that go back and do this across the United States and are particular to different areas in the United States for different times of year. So taking that into consideration and looking at the current situation of fuels and fire danger and fire activity and what the forecast weather and climate is going to be and how that's going to affect the fire environment going down the road, we then provide a detailed discussion and forecast of above or below normal significant fire potential for the next four months on a monthly basis. This is great for planning, for severity requests, uh, resource allocation and extension. So do we need to keep aircraft on later or bring them on earlier? Do we need to move them around? Do we need to bring crews in? Do we need to call up reserves? Those sorts of things are, all, are partially based off these outlooks. Kind of the nuts and bolts of the monthly seasonal, which is our uh, casual term for the National Significant Wildland Fire Potential Outlook. A brief synopsis, a synopsis of the past month's weather and fire activity, then a national overview of the outlook. Summarize the past weather, drought, and fire activity, especially for the past month. And then a summary of broad kind of climate teleconnection patterns that will obviously impact what we're going to look at for weather and climate in the next month or handful of months and how that's going to affect the fire environment. Uh, but then each geographic area provides recent and forecast weather, fuels, and fire potential information in their own outlooks that we then combine at a national level to produce the national level outlook. As I mentioned, we do have in-house uh, subseasonal to seasonal expertise. Uh, Rich Naden is the main person right now. We had another one retire just over a year ago, year and a half ago, uh, and we're training up uh, a replacement. So we always have two people to be able to provide this input on a monthly basis to the rest of predictive services. And the reason why we have in-house expertise, we have very talented people at the Climate Prediction Center uh, within the National Weather Service but they're not just focused on fire. They're focused on producing the best climate forecast uh, on a monthly or seasonal basis. And we need a little bit more expertise and a little bit more tailoring of those forecasts on how it's going to impact the fire environment, which is why we've developed our own in-house expertise over the last two decades. We obviously consult and collaborate with the Climate Prediction Center and use their products uh, and they participate on our calls and we participate on their calls. So we have a really good relationship with them. But like I said, we have a monthly presentation that is usually made by Rich, uh, Naden, and then these include internal discussions among the predictive services units on what they're looking at as well. So Rich provides, and you're gonna see example of this coming up, of everything we look at. And then obviously other people have some subject matter expertise in this arena and provide uh, and especially for their particular geographic area or region and how it might pertain to them and what they're seeing uh, for the next few months and obviously coordinate to make sure there's no weird border artifacts because the Northwest geographic area and the Northern Rockies geographic area don't see eye to eye. So what exactly do we look at? <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, the lift that Rich does every month to put together the presentation uh, it takes about a full week of his time. And then that doesn't include the own forecast that he has to make for his geographic area. You know, we obviously look at climate and teleconnection patterns. Uh, ENSO, the PDO, IOD, uh, PNA, MGO. Uh, we look at all of these and how that may impact our weather and climate coming up in the coming weeks to months. And then, you know, what sort of flavors of these uh, patterns and teleconnections are there and how that might impact us. We look at analog years, you know, we've seen this set up in the past with similar conditions. What did that look like? So it's not just all model forecasts. There's some other analysis that goes into it. We look at 
but we do look at climate forecasts that are issued by different agencies, uh, whether it's Canada, whether it's United States, Mexico, uh, Australia, and you know, that includes forecast temperature, precipitation, 500 millibar heights. And a lot of this comes directly from the climate models. And then one huge thing that we do is what are the conditions on the ground? What is the drought situation? What is fuel loading? Because you need fuel to burn. And there's some parts of the United States where that's not always the case. And there's very complex and heterogeneity in those relationships across different landscapes and different regions that makes trying to put all this together difficult. And that's why sometimes we look to analog years. It's not the only thing we use or the most important thing to use, but to give us kind of an anchor and perspective of what it might look like or what it has looked like in the past. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on these slides, but this is a sample of what we look at and what Rich presents to us each month, looking at sea surface temperatures, uh, look, try to find similar patterns to what we've seen in the past and what that may look like going into the future, how different they are, what were the effects of this, you know, how have we seen these effects in the past month or two months and what we think will be the progression of these or the lag of these on the larger scale uh, weather and climate patterns. More of this of, you know, we look at the anomalies and, you know, what does PDO look like? Is it negative? Is it positive? How strong it is? And like I said, this is just an example of what we're looking at and looking at not only spatial, but temporal, various spatial and temporal resolutions of these different aspects that are important to forecasting climate, you know, beyond a week uh, and getting into, you know, the subseasonal to seasonal forecasting. As I mentioned, we look to other uh, countries, you know, what are they doing? What's Bureau of Meteorology uh, thinking in Australia? And what are our counterparts at CPC looking at? Uh, looking at Japan, you know, we, we look at, you know, European output, Canadian output, not all of it is included in here, but like I said, this is just a sample. But we wanna see, is there consensus? Is there consensus in a forecast? Is there consensus in the uncertainty of a forecast? All of this plays a part in how we put together our outlooks. Um, here's just more, uh, you know, MJO, IOD, SOI, kind of looking at all the different aspects of what goes into this. Like I said, we look at a lot of information and sometimes it feels like a fire hose coming from Rich, but because we see this every month and most of us have been in this job for quite some time, or maybe not in this specific job, but have been looking at these things for a while, we, we do have a sense of, are we confident or not confident in the forecast and what we're seeing and how that will then apply to the fire environment and then how that will apply to potential for significant wildfires. Said here's just more models that we all look through. Uh, and then one thing that we do look at is, all right, the Climate Prediction Center have put out these outlooks. How does that compare to what we're seeing in say the CFS, the Climate Forecast System output? Are they buying one sort of solution? Are they kind of holding on to a solution that was from the previous month? Are they blending different models? And obviously we're in contact with them. And so we know some of the background, but as Rich says, you know, it's good to point this out and really hammer in the point, uh, points of why CPC is forecasting this and why they might not be forecasting something and how that would impact what we are looking for, which is that one step beyond a climate forecast and more into how does that affect wildfire potential? Just some more, uh, models that we look at, NMME, the Canadian, CFS version two, NASA. Like I said, we look at all these uh, at different time steps. We look at trends of these, you know, why are they showing this? You know, are they, what sort of teleconnection is really uh, perhaps biasing some of these forecasts or influencing some of these forecasts? So a lot of work goes into all of this. A lot of analysis goes into all of this. And it's a lot to take in. But with the in-house expertise and experience that we have, I think we do a pretty good job of making sense as best we can or as anyone can of what we think is going to happen in the next few months and being honest with ourselves of what's the uncertainty about that. Obviously, 
that's all happening up in the atmosphere. On the ground, we look at the response of what has happened in the atmosphere. You know, we look at the drought monitor. As my former graduate advisor, uh, Tim Brown, always used to say, drought does not equate to wildfire in all cases. And so you have to be careful to say, oh, drought's really bad here, then we're going to get big fires. It's not all the case. It depends on the landscape, just depends on the uh, ecosystem, and it depends on the time of year and what type of drought it is, uh, whether you know short term, long term, and you know the flash droughts, you know quickly onsetting uh, intense droughts that we see sometimes in parts of the plains or in the southeast, and and really anywhere at this point now. Um, but those all have different impacts on how we make our forecast. And then obviously we look at, you know, how's the drought going to improve based on what the forecasts are looking like in the next few months? Are we going to see improvement? Are we going to see persistence or uh, perhaps intensification? Um, or where are we going to see new drought? And all of this is very important uh, in making our significant fire potential outlooks. So here's uh, just, this is from uh, last year, last summer, uh, what CPC was issuing in terms of temperature and precipitation anomalies. This is for June. And then for the next three months, June, July, and August. And, you know, it, they did a pretty good job. Uh, one thing was the above normal for the monsoon was much more amplified uh, across the Southwest in the Four Corners region and parts of the Inner Mountain West. Um, but it was, we did have above normal temperatures. And, you know, we go back and validate. CPC goes back and validates and verifies their forecasts, and we're starting to do a little bit better job uh, for us as well. And then Rich puts together his own outlooks. So we have CPCs, we have the model outlooks, we have other uh, countries, agencies putting together their official outlooks and forecasts. And then Rich also provides what he thinks uh, is going to be a temperature of precipitation anomalies, and sometimes they don't line up exactly with what we've seen with others. A lot of sometimes it's a blend. Sometimes there can be quite uh, a disparity, uh, but we all know why our eyes are fully open and understand why those might be the, why that might be the case. So looking back at the ground as well too, fire danger is something that we really take into account. You know, what are the status of the fuels? You know, fire danger, if, I know we have a lot of probably fire experts on this, but just a brief refresher. Fuels, weather, topography, and risk combined to estimate initiation, spread, and difficulty of control of wildfires over an area. Here in the U.S., we have the National Fire Danger Rating System, which includes an NG release component, which is kind of fire line intensity, burning index, uh, which is kind of wildfire behavior, and uh, spread. You have ignition component, how likely is the fire going to start, spread component, how fast is it going to spread, and then kind of the intermediate uh, dead fuel moistures at 1, 10, 100, and 1,000 hour of the various fuel classes. We also do use the Canadian Fire Danger Rating System uh, in Alaska. That is the primary uh, fire danger rating system and also parts of the Great Lakes. So the most basic thing is you got good old Smokey Bear saying, hey, fire danger is very high today, but there's a lot of calculations that go into that to get the final adjective rating. And some of that includes looking at some of those uh, fire danger uh, components like ERC or BI, uh, which we all take into account. Now with us looking at a longer time scale, we're more looking at ERC and perhaps 100 and 1000 hour dead fuel moistures to get a sense of what the fuels are like. Another very important question, is there fuel to burn? <laughs> some parts of the, some parts of the country don't have that problem, uh, but many parts do, like parts of the plains, parts of the western United States, uh, where it's a bit more arid and it depends on how much precipitation you get and when you get that precipitation, and even sometimes what type of precipitation. Is it snow? Is it rain? All of these factor in. Um, it's very important, and it's also highly variable and pretty difficult to quantify unless you have a bunch of people out there taking photos on a regular basis. But we are making progress with new tools. You have the fuel cast from Matt Reeves, with the US Forest Service, uh, that's identifying these areas of where there's increased fuel loading compared to climatology. Uh, using models, using analysis, but also using some ground truth as well too, and showing, hey, we have way more fuel here than normal, 
that fuel is going to dry out quickly. So these are potential areas in the next month or season that could have increased fire activity just based on fuel loading. Here's another uh, fuel cast image that shows just 2017. What was the rangeland production? Uh, essentially, how much grass grew in these parts of the uh, you know, essentially western half to two thirds of the country? Uh, based on a 34 year mean, you can get down and dial into really small areas uh, and get trends for those over time and also compare it to average. Uh, we also have uh, Rangeland fire pr uh, probability from another group from the University of Montana, uh, based on, uh, I'm going to butcher their name, I forget, um, Maestis, I think, uh, et al. 2022, but they provide forecasts just for the Great Basin uh, based on the last couple decades or so of data, and they start producing those sometime mid to late spring, and then uh, through at least the uh, early part, if not mid part of summer, and show what is the fire probability based on how much fuel there is compared to normal and how dry that fuel is. Other things that we use, evaporative demand drought index examines how anomalous the atmosphere of uh, evaporative demand is, uh, you know, essentially the thirst of the atmosphere for a given location uh, and across multiple time periods. So you can look at one week, two weeks, a month, a year, six months, whatever. Uh, and these help us provide a window into perhaps fuel loading or what sort of elevation level or what sort of fuels could be a problem in the coming weeks to months. Snowpack is obviously a big a deal in Alaska and the Western CONUS. Um, you know, some areas have a very strong spring snowpack to summer fall fire relationship. But as mentioned, as you guys have probably heard in other uh, webinars and in Jesse's and some of the questions, some of these rules of thumb are not holding uh, due to climate change and, like I said, recent late spring and summer weather. You know, we've had years where snowpack was well above normal in the Pacific Northwest, Northern Rockies, but then they hit late spring, early summer and get a massive heat wave. And next thing you know, they're in the middle of a big fire season where perhaps 20, 30 years ago, uh, you know, a big snowpack would have been, you know, a normal fire season at best. So to our outlooks, this is what it looks like. We are forecasting potential, and I want to key in on potential. We're not forecasting wildfire occurrence or significant fire occurrence. And the reason we use potential is because of the uncertainty that we have. I always like to say, when we do these assessments, this is like the potential energy. This is the potential that is out there. However, as we've seen, you need critical fire weather events to realize that potential or realize the potential energy into kinetic energy. We have seen times where the critical fire weather events did not materialize, but we had potential. And we've seen where we've had uh, critical fire weather events, but not the potential and seeing not as big of an outbreak of fires. But when those two do align, that is when we get busy. And so we always stress to decision makers and fire managers, this is potential. In the you know sub seasonal uh, less than two week outlook becomes very important on when we're going to realize this potential. So we do it on a monthly basis, above normal, below normal, or near normal, and that's key. Near normal doesn't mean that you don't get fires. It's just what you're going to see typical for that part of the country for that part of the year. Like I said, we do that for every month for the next four months. Uh, and then it also feeds into the North American seasonal fire assessment and outlook, general discussion of conditions. We don't say that it's a significant fire, it's general fire potential. Our part of it is the same outlooks that you see, but this is only for the next three months. But uh, Richard Carr and Jenny Marshall from Canada and uh, Martina Barra and others from Mexico will help us out and provide their inputs. And we put it together and put this out usually the second week of each month. And there it is for the next three months above normal. This was last year. Uh, and then those are the contributors uh, to this each month. So we use quite a bit of forecast products. Um, it's always the accuracy lead time combination. You know, it's questionable trust in the forecast. 
wildland fire tends to be a little bit more reactionary and typically doesn't can, doesn't or can't make important decisions beyond one month, um, even with an accurate forecast. How can we communicate this to provide actionable intel? That's what we always come back to. We can have the best forecast, but if we can't communicate it or put it into terms that fire managers can use, it's no good. Communication, or excuse me, not communication, resource decisions, extend or not extend contract resources, bring additional resources on, and severity requests. You know, uh, say the state of Nevada is, you know, they got a lot of fuel and it's really dry out. They will put in severity requests for hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars to bring in additional resources to be prepared for that potential. This isn't easy. <laughs> As many of you all know, seasonal forecasting is hard enough and then taking the extra step or multiple steps to get it to what is it going to impact fires or fire potential. It, it's very difficult. It's very subjective. There's a lot of art to it. Um, we are working on improved verification of these to see where we can improve. Um, and our outlooks have gained a lot of traction in recent years. I think some of that has been due to the busier fire seasons. Um, you know, National Se Security Council uh, in the federal government, uh, FEMA, the uh, Federal Environment, uh, Federal Emergency Management Association. I think I got that acronym right. They want a briefing, you know, half the year. Uh, with these at the beginning of each month. Media picks these up uh, each time. And like I said, we're always working with the S2S community to improve and with other colleagues to see how we can do better. And that is the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Um, I have lots of questions, okay? So, <laughs> um, Maybe the, the chat will have some questions too, and I will let the people in the chat have first go. I see Al just put something in. And my sense is, this is from Al Pankrat. My sense is in the past, medium term temperature and precipitation anomaly forecasts have struggled as far as accuracy goes. Have you noticed the trend in skill and underlying seasonal models you rely on? No, I don't think in my time that I've seen, oh, I shouldn't say that. I think they have improved, um, but it's still, there's still some misses. And some of that comes back to big weather events can still have impact on climate timescales. And those are tough to forecast uh, in advance. And sometimes you get them, but not always. So I think we are, the skill is improving, uh, but is it to where we would like it to be, to be more confident in making our forecasts? No. Okay, so I, I do want to talk about verification validation. And I, I do take your point about potential um, because ignitions play a major role and that's another ball of wax. But temperature and precipitation, you can calculate skill scores. But what variable or metric would one use to do validation verification on? And do you use something like fire danger rating or? Yeah, you know, just where where are you at in that regard? So we're still not great with it, but I know on kind of more of a subjective basis, and some of it's it's objectively based, but it's subjectively applied. I think would be the best way to describe it is we have or most GACs have for this PSA for this time of year we expect one point eight significant fires or two point seven or whatever it is then they will go back and say, okay, we forecasted above normal. So if we said that there's two and a half significant fires in this particular area in our region, and we said that it was gonna be above normal for this month, did we get three or more? That's a win or not a win. And like I said, in any sort of consistent systematic fashion, we're not doing that, but more of my colleagues are doing that and we're working on a framework to have that be more systematic and more consistent. Okay. So <clears throat> there, there's a lot of information you use, which is understandable. Do you use machine learning in any of your approaches? We're starting to see more and more machine learning in various aspects of meteorology and climatology. So is machine learning playing a role? Not explicitly in our forecast, but like I said, we've had in the last six months, we've had a lot of people uh, reach out to us. Rich provided a presentation 
It was some webinar down here about sub-seasonal to seasonal verification. And there's a lot of people that are using machine learning, AI to predict climate variables. And some want to expand that to go the next step to fire potential. And so we're in, we're talking with them, but those research projects are either in the infancy stages or still just in the proposal stage. But we are working with people that are on the cutting edge, so to speak, of improving climate forecasts to help us make better fire potential forecasts. My next question is, well, it relates to ENSO and other oscillations patterns. Um, so when you're producing a forecast for the next month or the month after, how far back do you use ENSO information? Do you go back three months, six months, 12 months, 24 months, more? I think it, I think it depends. I think we take a look at the conditions and the uh, patterns that we see, um, but we always look back at least a few months and we, you saw some of those, we always go, oh, what was it this time last year? And we go back and look there. So routinely we go back 12 months and obviously look at the last one to three, one to six months uh, with care. But it just really depends on how far we get into the weeds and looking back at how it's transpired or what it was last year. But I do say we look at the trends and the temporal evolution of teleconnections quite <laughs> quite thoroughly in some cases. <laughs> okay. Um, so as many know, Lenina has been around for a while and now CPC is saying, well, it looks like we're going to switch to neutral and then most likely El Nino, okay? So if that does happen, if it's significant, how major of a player is it in the United States for for fire? You see, in Canada, and so the strongest signals in winter, and winter really isn't a problem for us for fires. Okay, whereas in the states, you know, you've got places like Florida that can burn quite happily in winter. Um, so, what what do you foresee if we see a, a medium to strong El Nino coming? Well, first, Mike, uh, your point to you know, we stopped saying, we try to stop say fire season, especially when we're looking at a national uh, national picture, it's fire year because every part, not every part, but parts of the United States can typically burn in any part of the year, um, especially at the lower latitudes. So it is, it could potentially be a major player, you know, any sort of major switch, you know, with the triple dip La Nina that we just saw, that obviously had an impact in the different flavors that we kind of saw with what we've seen on the West Coast in the United States this winter. You know, that's winter and spring precipitation has an impact on what's going to happen in the summer. So, yes, the summer pattern is important. You know, if you have an El Nino, sometimes that can uh, inhibit the monsoon or shift it more towards the plains or eastern parts of the uh, southwestern United States. And so that's something that we're looking at. But the magnitude of the shift and also the timing of the shift is really important. And right now we're what we call the spring predictability barrier, where we typically just have uncertainty. And then if the ENSO is making some sort of rapid shift in the next three, four months, that throws even more uncertainty into how that will look. And so if it shifts in, say, April, May, June, that's one impact or a different type of impact. But if it shifts more August, September, October, then that changes um, what our forecast is. Either way, it will have an impact, but how fast it shifts and when it shifts will determine where and how severe those impacts would be. Okay, yeah, lots going on. So, you know, if anyone has any questions, now is the time to put them in the chat. And this includes questions to uh, Jesse as well. Hopefully he's, he's still with us. Um, uh, we'll give you 30 seconds or so. Hey, hey Jesse. Um, and while we wait, um, if people have, you know, 
we've had Fuels Friday a while back, February flare-up. If folks have ideas of what we at Canada Wildfire can present uh, in terms of uh, a series of webinars, let us know. And uh, we're here to try and serve the community um, at large, uh, by our community. So, and thank you, Karen. She has posted something in the chat about the next Canada Wild Web webinar, which is coming up really quickly this time because it's like March 1st and it'd be featuring Jane Park and Mike May. And they were in Bolivia and they're just going to share some of their experiences about Bolivian fire management and uh, their experience down there. So look forward to that. And you can register CanadaWildfire.org. Yeah, the links there. Great. Thanks, Karen. And with, I don't see any further questions. I will say thank you, everyone, and hope to see the webinar um, next week. And special thanks to Jesse and, and Nick for a great presentation. And yeah, we're all clapping, all right, whether it's with <laughs> emojis or in real life. Okay. Uh, thank you very much and have a great day, everyone. Stay warm if you're in Western Canada. <laughs> um, Thanks. Cheers.